This time on Film Ranker, we are looking at the films of the great John Carpenter. Not including the TV films and anthologies, Carpenter has directed 18 films over four decades. While he is maybe best known for his horrors, there are some pretty excellent action, comedies, sci-fi, and even romance films in the mix. There's also a real style to Carpenter's work, from his distinct scores, to his deliberate pace, to his steady 90-minute run times, to his fascination with priests. Other than a couple of notable exceptions, a Carpenter film is pretty recognizable, and usually pretty darn good. So with that in mind, let's count down a great career from worst to best. The Ward even Carpenter's very worst films still have something to hold on to. Here, it's the uncharacteristically glossy direction, which offers some glimpses into Carpenter trying to update his style for better or for worse. There's also a fairly good performance by Madman's Jared Harris as the Doctor. Unfortunately, the negatives far outweigh those positives. The twists don't quite work, the characters fall flat, and any positives there are are hamstrung by easily the worst lead performance of any of his films. Memoirs of an Invisible Man Part sci-fi, part morality play, part comedy, part government intrigue, this Chevy Chase, Daryl Hannah team-up is a mess from start to finish. I remember being hugely disappointed as a Caddyshack and Splash loving kid, and the movie is not really aged any better. There are too many threads for a 90 minute film, but even with so much to do, the film somehow drags. Chase's never felt more flat, Hannah's never had less chemistry, even Sam Neill and Michael McKeon can't save it. In Carpenter's defense, it feels like this was the most externally produced of anything he's done. Ghosts of Mars The biggest saving grace of this film is that it's so bad that it is legitimately fun to watch. Every single line of dialogue is hilariously awful, and Natasha Henstridge is mind-blowingly bad at delivering them. Couple that with some weird fight choreography that often has people running aimlessly, a bad hard guitar riff soundtrack, and some amazingly over-the-top performances from Ice Cube, Pam Greer, and the final remnants of Jason Statham's hair, and you have an objectively terrible movie that is ideal for midnight marathons and pretty fun drinking games. Dark Star a film school project that became a no-budget feature, Dark Star has gained a bit of a midnight following, but it's not for everyone. There is charm to be found, especially in the clever ways that Carpenter creates DIY special effects, but the overall product feels more like a series of skits than an actual film. Some of the bits work surprisingly well, but the majority rely just a bit too heavily on high school philosophy and semi-stoner humor. Still an interesting glimpse into the beginnings of a very talented director. Prince of Darkness a weird movie with a weird premise that combines science and Satanism with a dose of zombie horror and siege film. Once you get your head around the premise that centers on a green mist in a giant jar that's trying to get science students to help it bring hell to earth, there is actually a pretty okay film in here. Some of the visuals are great. Uh, the Beetle Man, a possessed scientist laughing sadly into a mirror, a creepy postmodern shared dream but unfortunately the pacing largely is not, as the script feels a bit like it runs out of steam at about the halfway mark and the tension shifts kinda to autopilot. Still, it's worth watching and probably better than it gets credit for. Village of the Damned This one gets a lot of flack for the inevitable and not particularly favorable comparisons to the original and the novel, but taken on its own merit, it's actually not terrible. It's fun to see Luke Skywalker and Superman in a movie together, and with Christy Alley no less. The government agent subplot doesn't really work, but the kids are suitably creepy, and the ramp up of the violence mostly adds more than it distracts. 
it's still by no means a classic, but it's worth a watch. Christine. This adaptation of a Stephen King novel about a haunted car should not be as good as it is. While this feels a bit more work for hire than most Carpenter films, it has some of his signature touches. Where the movie really shines is in Arnie Cunningham's slow journey from nerd to killer. Arnie's relationships are given surprising depth. The film does dip in the final act, and the premise takes a bit too much suspension of disbelief, but the fact that Carpenter gets as much out of this film as he does is impressive. Escape from L.A. Alright, this is not a good film. The beginning is all tell don't show, the ending is a mess, and most of the stuff in between is ludicrous. But if you are in the right mood, that ludicrous stuff in between is pretty fun to watch. Kurt Russell is always great as the eternally whispering Snake Plissken, and watching him surf through the city with David Carradine, fight Shea Guevara in Disneyland, take on plastic surgery cult leader Bruce Campbell, and play a game of basketball to the death is almost as fun as it is incoherent. Yes, it's bad, but it's the good kind of bad. Vampires. Here we're getting to the legitimately great John Carpenter films. Even though Carpenter is known for his horrors, sometimes his best work comes when he's just having fun. And this is certainly one of those movies. It's kind of a vampire western wrapped around an awkward romance, and it works. It's a small movie that knows what it wants to be with a cool performance from James Wood at its center and just the right amount of vampire fight sequences to hold it all together. The Fog It's fitting that this film starts with a creepy campfire story. The Fog features a haunted treasure, pirates, and an ancient prophecy. It really is the quintessential ghost story. And while parts of it might be a bit cheesy for a modern audience, the all-star cast of Carpenter regulars is strong enough to build the world around it and then sell the heck out of that world, pirate ghosts and all, especially the mother-daughter team of Jamie Lee Curtis and Janet Lee. There is a lot to be said for the classics, and The Fog is a great story and a fun take on traditional horror. In the Mouth of Madness One of Carpenter's most underrated films. Sam Neill is great in this slow-burning Lovecraftian horror about a missing writer and a story that is burrowing its way into the minds of its readers. Sometimes the effects get a bit cheesy, and it maybe feels like a long ep episode of Twilight Zone, but for the most part, it builds nicely, and it keeps on building until that final scene. If you miss this one, it is well worth tracking down. Assault on Precinct 13 The movie that put Carpenter on the map is one of the best of the no-budget classics that came out of the late 70s golden age. It shares a bit of DNA with films like The Warriors, Class of 1984, and even Night of the Living Dead. A small group of cops and crooks are holed up in a defunct police station trying to outlast a gang of bloodthirsty ne'er-do-wells. What transpires is a pretty terrific siege movie that keeps up the claustrophobic pace until its very last minutes. Big Trouble in Little China Carpenter's most successful comedy is also his best pure action film. This East meets West Kung Fu sci-fi clash is the best of all worlds. Russell, of course, shines as the lead, aided by yet another terrific supporting cast. The romance with Kim Cantrell works, the weird Mortal Kombat guys are great, and the world under Chinatown feels weird but plausible. It's easy to see why this film has become such a beloved cult classic. They Live Carpenter's most overtly political film plays as well today as it did in the Reagan era. 
It maybe takes its time to get fully into its sci-fi conspiracy, but the payoff is so worth it. Piper is surprisingly good as the bubblegum deficient hero, and Keith David is equally great as his buddy slash opponent in what could well be the best back alley brawl ever to be put on film. It's a travesty that this movie didn't find the audience it deserved, but I have yet to meet a person who has watched it and doesn't love it. Starman. If you're like me, you probably remember Starman as a quirky romantic comedy that spawned a short-lived TV show with a guy from Airplane. But it is most likely a better movie than you remember. Its strength lies in the slow pace that allows Jeff Bridges and Karen Allen time to build a complicated and believable relationship out of completely unbelievable circumstances. Yes, there are a few fish out of water jokes, but Bridges' character is meant more as a mirror than a punchline, and he is so terrific at it that his performance earned the only Oscar nomination of any John Carpenter film. Escape from New York. Carpenter's most ambitious film is also one of his best. The film about a convict who has to travel through a post-apocalyptic New York that is now a giant prison in order to save the president is a great quest movie with a nice anti-hero twist. Kurt Russell is of course great, and he's aided by one of the best cult movie supporting casts of all time, with Donald Pleasance, Ernest Borgnine, Isaac Hayes, Lee Van Cleef, Adrian Barbeau, and Harry Dean Stanton but it is really Carpenter's direction that drives it all home, as he builds a believable world with all kinds of wonderfully specific touches that give us more than enough, but leave us wanting way more. The Thing. A masterclass in claustrophobia. It is incomprehensible that this film was ignored by audiences and critics when it was released in 1982. Russell and Carpenter are always magic together, but never more than here with this wildly original remake of a classic. The tension starts in the first frame of the film and never lets up in this story of a group of men trapped in a secluded outpost with a killer that can look like anyone. There isn't a wasted minute. Carpenter is the king of movies that gained appreciation after their time and this is the cream of that crop. Halloween. The movie that launched a thousand slashers is as good today as it was in 1978. The genius behind Halloween is its simplicity. A guy in a mask is killing people. Yeah, we get a bit of Michael's backstory, but that's it. Laurie's just a babysitter and Myers is just a killer. It's a minimalist film with a small, tight cast. Jamie Lee Curtis seems wise and talented beyond her years in her first role. Donald Pleasance is terrific as Loomis. And the soundtrack is brilliant. The pacing is perfect. The shifts from day to night are so effective. And Michael is used exactly the right amount to create a constantly building tension that doesn't need a huge body count to be effective. This is the roadmap every other slasher has tried to follow, and very few have succeeded. And that wraps up another episode. Thanks for staying to the end. Please like, subscribe, and comment, and go track down any of these films you haven't seen yet. Even a bad John Carpenter film is still a pretty cool film. Hopefully, I'll see you all next time.